from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the Lucas and Roddenberry franchises, the Martian Chronicles, and beyond. Science fiction is undeniably a part of our culture. But what exactly is science fiction? And how do you write a science fiction novel? This series will attempt to answer those questions. Okay, welcome everybody. We're uh, we've, we're descending into another episode with uh, Kate and Adam, and we're on Science Fiction Live. And um, I want to know, you guys, how's the how's the book coming? Where where are we at right now? What's the mindset? Uh, I had some fun yesterday writing a bunch. I was exploring, uh, you know, in, in our in our future, obviously, digital interactions and the way people interact is, is very um, very different than it is now. So I was ex I was exploring what it would feel like to like fully delve into like a virtual simulation or reality or something like that. So I was playing around with that experience a little bit, and uh, I don't know. I thought it was really cool. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so that's where we're kind of in now. We're, we're inching forward. We're, we're making progress, I would say. Kate, how um, come you've got some square boxes around your face there? You know, sometimes your camera just does some things that are interesting. I got to go <laughs> in and fix it. You guys continue because unlike Adam, I did not contribute this week. And <laughs> I am delinquent. Okay. I why, don't I, uh, right why don't I read you what I wrote yesterday? Oh, I'd love that. Okay. Uh, I wrote a whole bunch. I had kind of an interlude about like history, but I'll skip that stuff. Um, basically, at the end of chapter one, a character kind of wakes up, kind of, you know, splashes water, his face gets dressed. We, you know, we, we had some cool conversations about what like you know, nanites and kind of liquid flowing rooms and walls and stuff could look like. And then uh, he kind of gets ready and he engages what I call the the flow, which was essentially the flow of information or the river of, and then uh, so this is kind of um, where I kind of went with it. So let me know what you think. So, uh, Chapter one ends, I engage the flow. Chapter two starts with a little bit of history and then here. So when I was young, my grandfa grandmother had a pool with a small diving board on one end. I remember standing there psyching myself up for minutes before jumping in, knowing that the rush of cold water would drive the breath from my body and that for an instant, I would be overcome with sensation. But then by the time I reached the surface, the shock was gone and I was a happy kid in the pool. Engaging the flow is a bit like that, except if you were high. At any given moment, your brain is tuned into five into your five senses. If you turn off one sense, your body amplifies the remaining, which is why you hear better in the dark. But what if something else decided to do better and further imagine that your physical body was no longer a constraint? So the second you close your eyes, it amplified your hearing to five times your usual capacity while magnifying your sense of touch ten times. It's a sensory overload and it can kill you. Everyone has their own individual sweet spot, an equilibrium of your five senses that your brain likes to operate in. For some, visual stimulus, stimulus is all they need and the other senses are dialed down. For others, touch, smell, and taste, or sound. What this means is that the flow is different for everybody. It comes down to the same nature or nurture art argument. For me, I just go with what feels right and I love visual intensity and sensation. So when I tune in, I'm falling at a thousand miles an hour before I reach my destination within the flow. It's like space jumping to work and I love it. I call it my office. What it is is a virtual nexus that I point my incoming traffic. To. I heard it once described as lighting fireworks in a small space. I actually simulated that once, and yeah, it's about right. If someone were watching from my physical living quarters, they might see my eyes glaze over and the nanites form a chair beneath me as I'm eased into a reclined position. How security then goes on high alert is my physical body is vulnerable and in the flow. Never thought of much about that though. Too busy tripping out on information. So that's that's where I got. <sighs> so I was trying to create a trippy experience, or at least try and describe one anyway. 
That's that's really exciting. I mean, obviously, you're you're spending a lot of time in um in a in a first person sort of standpoint. And I one one idea I just thought of was, um, could you could you counterpoint the concept of a flow as like um a, a, an ominous background sort of um uh state? You know, I mean, kind of write it as like an omnipresent sort of um. Uh, you know, just something in the background about about this kind of like um, you could even call it the flow. Mm -hmm. It was like I, I think what you're referring to is like the flow state, right? And so that's generally something that's a positive type of thing, right? We're in a we're in a flow state, and Adams described, you know, his um, the character's um, you know ideal sort of homeostasis, right? Flow state, right? Mm -hmm. But you could fill in a lot of um, uh, third person uh, writing with, um, you know, the ominous nature of this 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 flow state, right? And, mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be ominous; it could be positive. But it nicely counter it 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 basically nicely um, you know counterpoints uh, uh you know the flow that you're looking to move towards, right? And and so, so the thing is, you might want to think about something like you know, the laws of entropy as, as, as the, as, as the natural thing. And we're the ones fighting upstream, right? Cause the law of entropy is just, that's the natural state. What we're doing as bringing light into the, uh, into the darkness, right. Mm -hmm. to, you know, to use an overused metaphor. Um, what we're doing is we're actually battling against that. Right. And so you could have some third person, um, you know, narrative coming in and, and, and really filling out, you know, some, some sections of that chapter. Right. So you could almost, um, you can almost reverse it, even like talk from the point of view of the, the floor or whatever, you know, boom, there's someone's plugged in, like what happens or something along those lines. What if you talked about it from the standpoint of entropy? You made entropy like a, a, um, a third person character almost, right? Mm -hmm. The natural state of entropy is this, and you know, and and along come the humans who 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 regulate and organize and um, you know this type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. A series of flow states moving against the natural laws of the universe, kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, I'm yeah, I know I'm. Uh, that, that's interesting. I think something of that might evolve. Like I don't know, Caitlin. Like in my head, I'm trying to decide whether this this flow thing is um, is really like ominous, or if it just is like you know, it just kind of is. It's kind of awesome, which is why we've kind of got lost in it a little bit. You know what I mean? As as a species, almost like uh, that movie Ready Player One. Yeah, there you go. Where everybody you know, it's kind of, forgets kind of like, to rush, right? It's, it's a bit of a draw. How cool it would be to like feel like you're skydiving and have your sensors, you know, skydiving on mushrooms or something, right? Like, well, I, I like that kind of concept of flow state in that you lose track of time, you lose track of everything, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's. That's really interesting. Like when I, when I hyper-focus in my ADHD world, you could be right here talking to me and I don't know you exist, mm -hmm. you know? And so like, it's the, it's kind of that concept. Like everybody has got that ADHD hyper-focus when they're in the, in the, in the flow state, right. Um, where you're like operating at 11, but, uh, you're totally disconnected. Well, you could do, that's kind of makes me think of Inception, right? Where they go, the lower they go into the dreams, the slower time goes. Their brains are running faster. So you could you could have like talk about the time differential, right? You've been working and working and working and working and working and working. And you come out, it's only been ten minutes or something, right? Um, that could be cool to play with a little bit. Yeah. Good job. I like it. It's it's good. I'm excited. I love your descriptions. Thanks. You're definitely gonna have to rewrite my stuff because I'm much more of a screen <laughs> <writer>. <laughs>
<laughs> but it, you know, I, I suppose my goal is that when people read it, that they're like there. You know what I mean? And then if you're experiencing it, then it can have a more profound emotional impact, especially if we're making a statement about humanity or philosophy or diversity or whatever. And we're, you know, we're using workplace as a, as a context, right? Um, so that would, you know, that would be the dream, right? You know, like Jan said, like, you, get them, you want to care about this character, right? You want to care about all the characters. I know what happens to them. Right. Yeah, I, I really think that this we should investigate this a little bit. Like, what is this, um, like this metaverse or this digital universe that our characters live in? You know, what is the general perception of it? Is it just a tool? Is it like a have to have? Is it a, you know, I think I think there's a little bit of like it's an, a bit of an addiction, right? And. Um, there are studies around the fact that like digital overload actually decreases innovation, right? So I kind of see like steady growth after a certain point of, of this tool being implemented, but you don't see those huge like spikes of innovation like you used to now where people have access to information, but are also able to unplug. And I think that that's something we can kind of play with is like, what are the impacts of this kind of system, right? Well, I like, you know, when you said about like, do people, do they have to have it, do they do it? Because when, when I was typing up the history before and I didn't read it, but I was talking about how, you know, the pandemics came and this kind of divided society into like people that were, pro you know government and pro vaccination and then the people who were not and then fast forward and now we've got like cell phones and now we're moving into space stations and like material is becoming more costly so now we're moving into like implants and that further divides society because you know those same groups that are anti-vaccinations as if they're going to put an implant in their in their <laughs> bodies and like this distrust and this divide kind of increasing into like yeah. two very different factions or ways of living. So we've got the, call it the plugged in and the unplugged or the reach, I think they called it, right? Um, that kind of thing. Yeah, I love it. I, I think we definitely need to investigate, like, I agree with you because in our story, there is that divide, right? We have the people on the edge or the reach or whatever we're gonna call it. Um, there, there's the divide there. And I think that we really need to talk about the, the technology of, of it as its own state, like the perception from both sides of it. Mm -hmm. So I think, that's, I think that's really good. We should kind of like map that out a little bit because as we interact with it, uh, we need to sort of have those epiphany moments, right? Where it kind of describes that. Yeah, and I think, you know, in, in statements like that, I think we're not trying to make a statement one or the other. I think the point here is, like, everybody's right and everybody's wrong, <laughs> you know? Right? So one is just as... Just the cat is alive one. and dead. Right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Schrodinger. Schrodinger. <laughs> so, Adam, you asked me earlier uh, about, about the submission to uh, an agent, and um, mm. <clears throat> there's definitely nothing... Um, standard about that but typically um a pitch would work kind of like this where you would send um a couple instances of chapters and each uh, agent might be a little bit different they might say i want uh you know the first two chapters uh a synopsis um and you know then we'll let you know what we're thinking well here's the thing you guys um do you have a science fiction book um and i think the momentum and the trajectory is going what i'm what i'm suggesting by sending something to um, a literary agent is number one it's going to force you to make the synopsis about what the novel is about number two the um first couple um chapters are, are pretty much written i'm really liking the progress that you guys are doing and maybe with with the added fire of someone saying yeah we're interested it's like okay hyper focus mm -hmm. we need to 
you know, we need to have this done by February, you know. Kind of thing. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and, and the synopsis is something that says, um, here's the overall trajectory of the way it is. And, and I think right now, you know, that, that regardless of whether or not a, an agent is interested, forcing you to, to come up and write the synopsis um, is something like, um, I don't know, do we still use mission statements with companies? Yeah. Okay. So something, a guiding principle that says, here's basically, you know, the value of the, of the book and this is where it's going and, um, gotcha. you know, that type of thing. So yeah. that, that was the reason why behind it. Um, and if, if there's third party validation in it to say, I mean, we're kind of doing things prior to, right. I mean, <laughs> it's like the entire book's not written yet. Um, and there's a general rule that, you know, 90% of anybody that you reach out to is just going to deny, you know, like not interested, mm -hmm. not interested, not interested, sure, yeah. right. Your first time authors, your, you know, so, so it's, it's a high risk investment. Well, I'm I'm not expecting that someone immediately is going to say, "Oh, that's amazing!" and "Yes," and of course, and you know, here's your signing bonus. And who do we write the checks out to? <laughs> right? I'm not expecting that that's gonna yeah, that yeah. that's gonna happen. Um, and the the other aspect is, um, I would assume that we might want to stay away from vanity publishers, which you know essentially means that we don't care about the quality of your book. We just care if you're going to pay us in multiples of $10,000 to mm. publish your book. And that, yeah, that's think, always a little bit disappointing, you know? I think we, we set up, we had this conversation when we started, right? People were like, hey, well, why are you going to write a book? Write a book in a weekend, you know, make it as a lead magnet, do this, do whatever. And we were like, no, you know what? That's not our style. We want to make something that we're super excited about, that we think is super epic, you know, which is why we're going to this rate and roll. It's harder to write something awesome. I could put facts down on a page and pump out a, you know, a textbook on my views on business strategy. I could do that easily, but I think this, you know, could, could I apply it in a human way that teaches it like, like this is way harder. <laughs> so, um, yeah, like I a hundred percent agree. Man. Like let's shop it around someone that likes our vision. Yeah. yeah. Well, it is so like, okay. I'm gonna put on my flow process hat. So we go and we search publishing agencies and then there's a submit your synopsis or whatever, what link or form. And we submit it and 99.99999% are just gonna ignore it. Yeah. You might get a lot of rejection too. Not interested, not interested, not interested. But part of it was to get that process down of here's mm -hmm. The agent, they obviously do look at science fiction. They are going to look at this and, um, you know, just starting to introduce you to by dipping your toe into that world. That That's kind of the idea. Okay. And, you know, because, you know, you get some interest. It's like, holy shit, we've got like chapter three and four kind of written. We know where it's going to go. We've kind of got these ideas worked out and they actually really like these first few chapters and we've drawn them in. It's like, okay, boom, we need to, you know, like we need to really, really, you know, get this, you know, wrapped up. And it's like, you know, we've all been there in, in deadlines. We've all been there on, We've got to make a big presentation to the clients or, you know, whatever. And we have to be prepared by the 15th of January. It's like, holy shit, you know, mm -hmm. like. Yeah, I, I, don't know, I think that's exciting. I mean, I would love if we could get to the point where we're connecting, like Caitlin kind of started in the middle somewhere. If we could connect those, even get that part done. I think it would go a long way to like um, speaking to the story and the quality of the writing and. Right. If someone could get to that point. Like you said, that's when you're invested. Right. Um, that would be probably a good goal, I think. It's all right. So back to the process piece. It's just I'm just I'm yeah, I'm processing the process. Um, you get rejected. And so then what's your options from there? Like self-publish, like you said, like vanity publish, where you just pay somebody to publish it. And then you do all the promo work. Keep. Well, 
I want to okay actually this is really interesting um there is something that I'm testing right now as you know from a wearing a publisher's hat okay and it, it's Barnes and Noble okay and they only offer um they're called personal published uh, uh personal uh, published book and you can have you know all the graphics on it you can put the UPC on there um, and it's by Barnes and Noble okay so what I'm imagining for you guys is that you could order 10 copies and give them away because this is part of also something that's like very you know Kate and Adam sort of thing right mm -hmm. um, and so you know you may not have to go through the traditional, um, you know, publishing thing at all. You might be able to say, Hey, we've come up with the book. Um, and you know, we're going to say, for example, have Barnes and Noble publish, you know, one full book, send it. And then, you know, we're good just to give it out, you know, uh, to people that we want to give it to. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, the next um, like ramp up from there is to be able to, you know, I mean, it's listed, it's on all the, it, you know, it's on all the publications, it's on Google books and Apple books, it's available on Kobo, it's available, um, you know, and distributed on in, in, in channels and stuff like that. Right. So that's where the vanity publishers could come in because you, you have a book and distribution is a key thing. But if your scope of your distribution is really like, um, I like to have this for clients and family members and, you know, to a limited group of, of people and we kind of give it away as promo and we kind of talk about it and we keep doing this and we can kind of keep revising it and updating it, then you don't necessarily need to go down that pathway where the publisher is saying, yeah, we like it. And, you know, now we're going to get you as, as, um, um, you know, co-authors into the science fiction world. Right. You may say, I didn't, you know, we're okay not to do that. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was trying to get you guys to think about. <laughs> yeah. And I've self published a book before, you know, is a children's book about tooting. But still, oh. went through the process. <laughs> um, and the most frustrating thing with that is, like, their print on demand print locations caused shipping costs that were actually. Yeah, shipping was more than the book, right? So I was on all these channels and platforms. That's great. As soon as you check out, you're screwed. So I was like, mm. that was a lot of work for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know that I'll, and, and uh, one of the drawbacks, um, like I'm working with a, I, I'm trying to evaluate the Barnes and Noble thing. And one thing is, is they don't ship to Canada. Mm -hmm. So I, I know that's a, probably a deal breaker for you, but you know, for me, I've got some, you know, people in, that, um, I'm, I'm, ta I'm doing something with my son. Okay. And so effectively we're taking the Iliad from Homer and we're reading it with a, a translation that we both like. And we're going to be going through the book and then the father and son, we're actually going to write a response and an essay that will go after the Iliad. Right. And so this is more of a personal copy of a book. Now, the, the funny thing is, is that it, it doesn't very cost very much. It was like twenty five bucks, including shipping. Right. So um, for me and for the publishing aspect that we're doing. Um, the one-off thing works completely fine. It's a really cool thing. I'm actually going to be working with a, um, a, a teacher from, um, I, I think his classroom's in Harlem, actually. So he's, is, you know, the story of like the, you know, the inner city kids, right? And he's just one of these, you know, like English teachers that it's like, there's some kids in their class that really like um, Animal Farm or, um, you know, some classics that he's working on and to be able to have that student take the book and then put an essay at the end, their essay in response to and have a hard copy memento of this was my work alongside this classic. That's where I was using it in that case. Right. Um, but I think, you know, really, I'm trying to find out what the goal is. If you want to hand these out to clients and it's like a $30 cost, 
Um, and you can update it or correct it or develop it or improve it over a period of time, then maybe that works because you're like, you know, here, here client, here's the book. We really think you might, you know, benefit from this, that type of thing. And it becomes part of your, um, giveaway or, you know, your conversations or, you know, for important clients and and stuff like that. Um, But if you want to be able to get it into the thought and we were going to use it as a lead magnet, like what you're talking about, like giveaway, we're just going to do it for our our own selves to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think a client might read it and it might make them think, but I don't know if they'll, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I see it as a, as like a, Hey, hire into solutions type thing. I think it's kind of like, let's create something that we think is very positive and amazing and creative and let's throw it out in the world and see what happens, you know? Um, so. So we need a publisher who's willing to print two copies. <laughs> <laughs> one for Adam and one for Kate. Oh, or three. I want, I want one too. Yeah, two, three. <laughs> no, my well, mom will want one. My mom will want one. Yeah. 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 What I really <laughs> like about the... But she'll put it on the shelf. What I really like about the iterative publish model is that like Google Books and Apple Books, it's really interesting is that if we decide to change it, change a character, add a character, we can update it. And in the digital world, it just updates, right? I, I could put this on, on, um, on Google Books, uh, you know, very easily and, you know, do that kind of process for you guys. Uh, Kate's already got some experience with the, you know, the self-publishing. I like the Barnes and Noble piece because it, see the the cover that we've put there, whether that's the one we decide to go with or not, it doesn't matter. But typically, um, like the proof copy is like no graphics and it just says proof all over the front. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, here's your evaluation copy. Um, and it's like, I don't really want to put that on shelf and it doesn't really say what I want it to say. And, you know, these kinds of things. Right. So for all intents and purposes, it's a really well published, either, um, hard copy, right. Or, or a soft copy, right. Or like, um, a paperback. Right. Mm -hmm. But to get a nice hard copy of, you know, what you guys put into and the fact that you could revise it over time or um you know i don't know i think that's that's kind of a cool thing i i um i think with the on-demand publishing i think that's uh you know quite an interesting you know proposition right well let's see i mean we've got our you know december 31st let's kind of do an epic job of getting a bunch written and yeah say let's throw it out to the world and see fully expecting you know rejection from pretty much everybody but let's and then we can write more and then send it back and write more and send it back like let's try i, I think aim big right? yeah um why not I like that. Yeah. okay well i mean keep your eye out for you know um science fiction uh literary agents you know i mean you can consult the google oracle for that i know i've mm-hmm. given you guys one but it just that's the kind of thing right mm-hmm Hasn't somebody built like an interface yet where like all book writers go and all publishers can go swim and through the data and find what they like? In terms of agents connecting to writers? Yeah. Well, no, they were actually um, waiting for Enta to build that. And um, there we go. There's an app. We need an app for that, right? that, That would be a great app. Right. Yeah. It's like, hey, I'm an author. This is what I'm writing. You don't even have to submit anything. As you start building out your synopsis, you can submit a chapter, submit more. You know, people could crowdsource. Other people could read it. Other authors could read it. They could vote you to the top, <laughs> promote you authors, promoting authors. And then all of a sudden, boom, all of the publishers come in and pick the ones that they like. It's yeah, you know, like a GoFundMe concept or something like that, right? Like, yeah, go publish me. You know, Lego, Lego does this with. Uh, you can <laughs> That's awesome. Submit, okay. You can submit a design to Lego. Yeah. And then it's just all open source, and people vote on their favorite like fan designs. And there are no promises, but like the ones that get voted the best, Lego may take it and turn it into a, an actual. Part of their, 
package, right? So it's kind of similar model. So exciting, right? Yeah. Go publish me. I will publish that. I will, yeah, it's worth creating it and it'll be (laughs) the place for authors to not have to pound so much pavement. They can be busy writing with which they're good at. There you go. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, Dan. Another good business idea brought to you by Kate and Adam. There you go. You were I had a whole very good business idea. I I'd be rich. Be a millionaire. Yeah. I yeah. would. No, this I, is the thing. I, I it was Gary V who said this the other day. Is that he was like uh, way back when he was at a conference and. They're going there with a whole bunch of other liquor store owners, right? And he was telling everybody, like, email is the future. This is what we're doing. It's working really well. And his dad's like, why are you telling them? They're going to go do it. He's like, yeah, so they can't take my brain, right? Ideas are a dime a dozen. Executing them is yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. No one does it. I mean, we do it all the time. We just, you know, we just had a client. We told them, like, what to do, what to do next, what to do after that, what to do after that, give them all the stuff, give it to them. And I, my guess is <laughs> they'll look at that and say, that is just way too much information. Just come and do it for us, right? Ideas are, um, I don't know, all these values what you do with them, right? Kate's absolutely right. I want to give you guys a, um, a, a similar scenario. There's, um, um, a physicist, one of his personal blog, uh, personal blog I was looking at uh, for a physicist, and he said, before you send me your idea of um, the way you view the world, like some sort of revision to, um, you know, the, to physics or an improvement on Einsteinian uh, <laughs> the world, right? Because he, he's apparently they get, physicists get them all the time, right? I've got a great yeah. idea. This is actually how the world works, right? Or, yeah. you know, and, and so he said, you'd be surprised. He goes, physicists have ideas all the time. That's not the, that's not the idea. It's, it's not the idea that matters. It's, it's um, coming up with uh, the testability. Mm. It's coming up with, well, you know, you know, let, how do you prove it? Right. And so it, it speaks to what Kate was saying. It's like ideas are a dime a dozen. Who actually can do it and who can execute on it? And then what value is it? Right. And then how is it scalable and, uh, you know, all these kinds of things. Right. And, and so and this is why capital is king, because people with money can invest on multiple ideas at multiple times. And have teams of people execute them and then be like, okay, this is the one that's going, right? Mm-hmm. Like so many times in life, I'm like, okay, I've got this idea. I'll plug that away. I'm going to plug that away. When I have time, I'm going to do this. When I have money, I'm going to put it towards this. But yeah, execution is hard. It's stinking hard. And unless you have a ton of money to just throw at it to see, <laughs> which is yeah. like 1% of the population, <laughs> right? Yeah, I was out walking the dogs today, um, okay. my wife, and 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 I was thinking to myself, I you know I was me you know I was, you know sometimes you're thinking I was thinking well I should go back and and you know pursue a, a, a PhD right, yeah. and I was thinking um, well, you know the issue with that is that I'd almost want to be the hybrid of the PhD that isn't just the academic but also is the one doing it. Right. Like providing something rather than, you know, then eventually you can be what on CBC and you can say, um, you know, describe the reality, the way the world's working in, 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 you know, in just complicated words for people to go. OK, you know, now who's going to do it? Right. Yeah. Like. Yeah. And and I think that's maybe the issue of why um, in some cases there's actually a distrust between the. um you know, the plebeian or the average individual, and then, you know, the experts in society, it's like, well, great. Well, can you do it? You know, can you actually make that happen? It's a great idea. But, you know, I remember years ago, I was talking to uh, an undergraduate at UBC. And she told me about this amazing idea that she had for simplifying language. 
Okay, here we go, right? <laughs> I said, I said, that's a great idea. I said, well, why don't you go and market it and take it into the market and see who buys that idea? And like the glazed look over her eyes was like, what? What? Why would I? Like, you have to have people buy into it. Just because it's a great idea means like, is there any kind of organic buy into this? Or, like, yeah, great idea. Okay, go find out who actually will support that idea in the market. Well, this is echoes of like crickets everywhere. <laughs> well, how many how many software startups have we heard about that started in like 2016 ish, 2017? You know, I know Zoom was before that, but other ones where everyone's like, yeah, this is awesome, but like, why do I need it? Right? Boom, enter the pandemic, all of a sudden, how to stay on the market. And now, even when we're somewhat able to go back, we're like, no, no, I'll use that. It's way better. <laughs> so sometimes the market doesn't know what it needs. And that's, you know, famous Steve yeah. Jobs is famous for that, right? It's just say, yeah. no, you idiot. This is what you need. <laughs> you know? Um, and those are remembered as the true visionaries. And so if you if you really think you're one of the 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1% of 1%, of 1%, of 1% then hold on to that, and you might be the Steve Jobs. <laughs> but chances are, you should go and clean your room, and go to your day job, and do like the rest of everybody else, right? Well, they say the better you are, the luckier you get, right, Dan? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know what? Though we are seeing, like Adam and I were just talking about this this morning, like the Great Resignation. People are sick of their day jobs. People are sick of working at places that don't care about them. And through the pandemic, they realize they can operate with less mm -hmm. and still be just as happy or that it's not worth it to be unhappy in your job because mm -hmm. life is short. Whatever the realization is, they're up and leaving. And, you know, people are making choices that are would otherwise be counterintuitive. like walking away from double the pay offer to come work for a small business that may or may not make it. Yeah. But you like the team, right? Like these things that like five years ago, that would have been unheard of, yeah. you know, <laughs> but it's, we're changing, we're changing that. So you might see a lot more ideas being executed is my point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And maybe we need more ideas, right? Well, this is going to amplify our, our technological advancement trajectory to get us onto this book's path so that we're going to end up writing a, a, a fiction. Right. Yeah. Very yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's circle back to the novel um, <laughs> a, a little bit here. I mean, no, I love this. This was fine. This was fine because we, I mean, I think it was very worthwhile to, you know, take that, um, that detour. But, um, Kate, what's the, the, the ball is going to be lobbed to you for next week because we're going to be back to back recording next week. Um, what, what are you going to do for us by next week? I is that seat like hot there? That seat is, you got a warmer under your pot there, right? So what, what's the, I got the hot seat, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're on the hot seat. What, what are you going to do for next week? There's another little mini Dan lighting a fire right underneath my, <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, I think the last place I left off was uh, they were um, leaving our guy to die. So I'm just going to pick up and keep writing forward, actually, because that's where my inspiration is taking me. Good. Good. Cool. Yeah, you you had, you had brought us two kind of crazy characters last time that I think were really, really fun. Yeah, I think we need to build some of those characters out. Kate, I want you to focus on these words that I'm going to tell you. Um, Adam's great. <laughs> Say that again, Dan. Can I just want to hear yeah, yeah. No, no, no. no, Adam's great, but you're great also. So I don't, I, I don't want you to think with your writer's voice. Don't smother it right now. And I, I've seen this a lot with writers. They invariably will think that they're writing. Um, like you may have enough confidence that you don't think your writing's bad or anything, but you might, because you're working with Adam, you might really like his qualities and think, I heard you say something, well, you have to rewrite my stuff. No, 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 no. Don't think that at all. And there's going to be times when you're writing, you'll be like, ah, I just, 
let's just get it out. Okay. Like, um, think of it as the birthing okay. process. Let's just Are get Adam it out. What's that? I'm okay with that making me better. He's been doing it for six years. Okay. Well, all I'm saying is that you have, you have the ability, like just push through it. And what you are writing is actually really good, right? So okay. keep writing it and remember that you're not even at your first draft yet. Yeah. And so before you bring Adam in or an editor in, let's just get it so that you're like, yes, this is what I want to say. And it doesn't matter if it's grammatically incorrect or if it's not following something that like before you put the editor on or before you get Adam to, to you know, to you know, put his focus on it. Let's just, you know, let you develop before you smother, um, you know, what, what you could actually um, contribute. Right. Cause I, I think well, you got you. something I really good. You. Yeah. Well, it goes both ways, right? Like at some point here, we'll both kind of take the right pen to each other's stuff. You know, that's just how well, we operate. Sure, yeah. you know? So, well, you might, you might also find that, um, like, I don't know, um, what you guys, what your guys's plans are for editors or multiple or an editor or multiple editors. But once you have a rough draft, um, I think that's a really, really good time to bring in an editor and realize that the book's not really that great with, as a rough draft. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because what you've been able to do is just get it down. And then from that point, you say, okay, who is the editor that we really want to work with? And it may be more of a development editor. What are you trying to say? What is, are you using consistent um, first person, third person? How are you developing it? All these kinds of things. And then that's where it's going to be all. I don't want you guys to get into a second guessing. Maybe we should do it this way. Maybe we should do it that way. The editor looks at it and goes, it was actually better the first time you wrote it. <laughs> so the intuition was right. Mm -hmm. You technically may have been wrong, but your intuition was, was, was right. So do it so that it just, the intuition is right and the idea is on paper. And then we'll step back and look at it and then say, okay, who do we want to bring in from like an editor standpoint to make this uh, make sense? And I think that's, one of the best things you can do for, for the book, but you will have had the entire, you know, idea on paper, right? Okay. Yes. I like it. I'm, I'm actually flow processing it out in my head with the timeline. I saw that flow chart. When are we going to be graced by that uh, graph and the flow chart again? I, I think that's something we should. You say the word, the I'll, make, I'll make sure I, from idea to bookshelf flow process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I mentioned earlier on about um, uh, Vox Day. I, he was um, that controversial figure that I had on, on one of my right. shows. Yeah. Now, he's somebody that um, was, I guess, nominated for the um, Science Fiction Award in one of his books. OK. Um, and so that's why um, I brought I brought him up. He's a he's he's a science fiction writer um, and a video game developer and all this kind of thing. So on on one of our episodes on a uh, on a on a podcast that we were doing, we had like. Three thousand views on one of his videos. Because he sent it out to his network. Right. Right. I mean, we're usually seeing about 100, 200 views per episode. And mm -hmm. he was like, hey, guys, you know, and so he's he owns a publishing company um, and he's a science fiction writer. And he, um, you know, so, you know, there's a community there. Right. And, you know, this is your chance to really create that fictional world. And, you know, whether you want to compete in that kind of world or whether it's. um a representative world of your business collaboration, right? A little bit more of an emphasis there. That's really what you're going to have to start thinking about, right? And yeah. I think it'll just naturally develop. But um, you know, like I want to ask you guys: Do you would it? Is this just like an unintended consequence that if the science fiction world just loved it and gobbled it up, 
um, you, you know, you, do you think that would be realistic or do you think this is more of a book that's going to turn into um, uh, basically the fictional representation of the consulting end time? I think the first one. I would hope for the first one. Yeah. I, you know, I hope that people recognize the humanity in it. I think the best best science fiction stories are pictures or or stories about humanity that just happen to take place in the future. Yeah. And the idea of a, of a dawn or a new birth or a rebirth is, um, it's a, it's actually a very Christian thing. In fact, um, it's, it's actually kind of what the cross means. I'm not saying that's what you're, but, for inspiration, there's a lot of history yeah. in rebirth and renewal mm-hmm. in, in a Christian tradition, right? Um, and quite simply, you know, we live in a Christian culture, right? I mean, you know, just the way it is. So you can draw inspiration from some of that, some of that substrate if you like, or you can comment on some of that substrate. Have you thought about what religion or uh, the metaphysic uni- the metaphysics look like in in, in, in the future? We have not delved into that conversation. We oh, probably should. Yeah. So just the words of a new beginning, these kinds of things, this renewal, this rebirth, this kind of, you know, this kind of thing um, has a huge, huge philosophical history and theological history within um, and through Christianity. So mm-hmm. something to consider when you're, deciding where to draw inspiration from or, you know, and it it doesn't have to be an alignment or an agreement. You could make strong theological claims against certain things. I personally um, find the anchor point in our culture predates that. And that's why I I spent a lot of time in the, in the Hellenic origins or, you know, the Greek origin stories. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I find that that um, is, you know, I mean, but I just advocate for an education in the classics, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm, now my brain is going. This is good. This is a good thing. I'll have to think on this. Well, what gets people thinking when you start, like, when you when you when you have a barbecue or you have family over? Invariably, if somebody starts talking about politics, or here it comes, Kate, climate change. Or, he did it. Yeah. <laughs> or 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 religion, right? It's like these are the these are the things. It's like they're they're like um they're contentious, barbarous like topics that get people like they have an opinion on it, right? So you know the commentary behind that and how much you delve into it and how you draw parallels and how you contrast all of these types of things are. Like, you know, they're, they're all a possibility. Well, you're making me think so like, okay, this is maybe like next episode kind of conversation. Cause we could delve deep into this. But yeah. Here's what you're making me think is like right now, um, like sexuality, religion, everything, all these contentious pieces, they have a lot of like trolling happening, right? People are, belittling others and everything if we had technology that could detect and remove these things like maybe you actually stop progressing conversations um you don't even give somebody the ability to challenge what they think they already know and so it really segregates opinions that's that's brilliant i think that is a a perfect way to summarize the end of today's show and say Let's bring that up for conversation again um, next week, okay? Right. And um, I think I think that'll be good. And and Kate, you're gonna add a little bit more writing to you know where you're at. Yeah. Character development. I've given you guys both something to think about from a a spiritual, theological, um, birth, rebirth, Ooh. renewal kind of concept. Um, think about whether you want that to be the transition point, the door to which once the reader goes through that door, there's no going back. 
right? That transition right. point. And I think we were we're putting that transition point at the point where the character was in the pod and being jettisoned out. But there's everything that leads up to that. There's everything that follows with that. And we're not saying that that has to be the, the point. Um, it could change, but you know, there's there's this this kind of thing. So how how are they reborn? How are they brought into something? Um, is it more renewal and renaissance returning? Like in history, we have um, uh, a, a renaissance, a, re, a returning to more of the classical traditions, right? Yeah. Is there anything like that? Because we're very misguided and we don't know with the empty overlord that is technology. I don't know, right? <laughs> All of these things you can comment on and, and build, you know, the characters around. Yeah, very cool. Thank okay. you, Dan. Thank you, guys you for awesome. your to be me. <laughs> See you next week. I will.